All right, welcome back to Integrated Rangeland Management. This is the first sort of introductory lecture that will set the stage for the rest of the course. Call it What is Range Management? Largely, these are my views, the way I think about how range management as a profession has evolved. And hopefully on discussion in discussion this week, we will talk about range management and what we can do about it. Okay, some things you got to understand about rangelands before you can really take a stab at management. One is that rangelands are incredibly diverse places. They're all over. Half of the earth is range, and it comes in a lot of different forms. So across the globe, the tundra in the Arctic to the African savanna, the outback of Australia, the Sonoran Desert and Sagebrush Steppe right here in the U.S., and just everywhere in between, uh, you'll find parts of rangelands. And largely, um, they, we use the same kinds of management tools and techniques on all of that, those diverse lands. So almost no matter where you want to work in the world, there will probably be some rangeland in your back door, and, um, and and hopefully we'll learn the principles about how to manage those lands and give you some opportunities to see the globe. Also in the U.S., there's diversity of rangelands. Of course, our beautiful sagebrush step here in Idaho and Nevada and Utah and Wyoming, but also there is mountain grasslands, the plains, the large grasslands of the plains, the oak savanna of California, of course the Chihuahuan and Sonoran Desert uh, down, down in the southwest. All of those are rangelands, and again, they're managed by similar principles. We're going to focus on those uh, main common So the diversities are brought to rangelands by the dominant plants. Some, the grasslands, of course, are dominated by grasses. Shrublands uh, dominate mostly the deserts and, and the of course, what we call shrublands. Savannas and woodlands and open forests are all have a, a component of trees. And then the tundra and wetlands are both very different, usually having um, a group of plants that are kind of lower stature, often woody or certainly perennial at the base. So all of those ecosystems have different kinds of plants that dominate them and slightly different sort of tools and options for management. But it's a pretty exciting place to work because of the diversity of ecosystems and plants that we have to work with. Probably the only, well, the only thing that separates rangelands from other kinds of lands is, one, we don't have a dominant overstory of, sh of forests, because that would put us in forest management or forestry. We also have enough vegetation to have grazing or fire. If you don't have enough vegetation, then you have really barren deserts, and the tools that you learn in this class won't be very useful for those. So as long as there are herbaceous plants and shrubs, and succulents uh, without a dominance of overstory plants, then you're in rangelands, and the tools that you learn in this class will be useful in management. The reason that we want to look at tools for management is because these are extensive, beautiful, diverse lands, and there's a lot of things that challenge their integrity. Some of the things that I know you've heard about, unsustainable grazing practices. We've all heard about overgrazing. You can read it in the paper nearly every day. I'm going to distinguish between grazing and overgrazing. We're going to talk about unsustainable grazing practices and how they damage integrity. We'll also talk about how appropriate grazing practices improve integrity of rangelands. Damaging fire regimes are of concern throughout the North America and, and, and even Australia is having some terrible fires right now. Um, but there's also healthy fires that preserve and maintain rangelands. Invasive plants, certainly a concern, trying to find ways to use them and minimize their impact, we'll talk about in this class. Global climate change is unfolding in front of us. We don't know all the implications of it, but we'll talk about it throughout the semester. Human development, whether it be subdivision, roads, wind power uh, generation, um, Power lines, all of those things are affecting how ecosystems work. We'll talk about options for management of those. So think about your favorite challenge to rangelands. Let's hope that we can talk about that. So in essence, rangeland management is a, uh, a planning process. The, term, the definition I use for range management is the use and stewardship of rangelands to meet the goals and desires of society. It is a planning process. We start with a current set of rangelands. We need to look at what we have, what resources we have, and uh, dream up some possible alternatives and try to get to those alternatives. They have to be realistic, 
alternatives. We need to be able to use the resources available in sustainable ways. But it's basically a process of knowing where you are and where you're headed. So it's a planning process. That's what range management is. Now, what determines what is the best future to have? Well, that depends. Uh, when I took range management a couple of decades ago, it was really perfectly fine to focus simply on livestock production as the goal for range management. For a lot of reasons, there's very few people that focus just on livestock production. There's a whole host of other values for rangelands. What value you want to focus on for management depends on your worldview, depends on how you look at the world and aspects of value. So it depends on whether you consider yourself a preservationist, a conservationist, utilitarianism, or pragmatist. All of those would be just kind of terms that might um, try to capture your worldview. Preservationists are those that really emphasize um, the, the preservation or protection of lands from major uses such as mining, timber, grazing, development. Um, a, a lot of you probably have heard of the work of John Muir and certainly Aldo Leopold. Uh, they were sort of the founders of the preservation movement, and I hope that a few of you in this class hold preservation values in, your, um, in the way that you look at the world. Many of us, and I will include myself in this, are more in the conservationist mode, that, that road that was set up by Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, John Wesley Powell. This conservationist view is that, um, that you can use land and still protect, protect it for future generations. So ideas such as sustainable yield, sustainability, multiple uses, all came out of the conservationist movement. Um, this movement, these ideas focus on using land but protecting it for future generations. Utilitarianism uh, was the beginning of the uses of rangeland management. My grandfather, when he was out on the range, he didn't really think a whole lot about the future. He was just trying to buy land, pay taxes, pay the mortgage. So he was really into using the substrates, the resources he had available to him, as a saleable product. Many people still are caught in that idea that, that the goal of land is really to maximize outputs and often economic returns. So although I think in the U.S. we focus more on conservationists and we try to preserve for future generations, there's many places in our country and throughout the world that really focus on just trying to make a living on land. Uh, where you fit in these sort of worldviews, nothing is right or wrong. Um, they're just different views of the world. I like the color red. I'm not sure what your favorite color is, but if your favorite color is blue, you're not wrong. It's just a different worldview. So I'm going to try to um, grab your worldviews and bring them into this class, and we're going to try to be tolerant of each other's views because they're not right or wrong. Depending on what your worldview is, you have to make decisions about what's the appropriate way to get to your future. Uh, how do we? What are the sources of decisions? Where do we get that information? Well, hopefully, in this class, we use scientific information, well-tested theories to uh, decide how to get to our future desired condition. But hey, there's, we don't know everything about the world. We don't know every option. So we're also going to use traditions. We're going to have to make guesses once in a while. We might even be just caught at, in, making, in using hunches to make a decision. So try to make decisions based on scientific information as much as possible, but there's a whole lot of other information that we use to get to our desired future. Why do we need science? We're going to try to focus on science a lot in this class and make well-informed decisions, um, but managers have to integrate scientific knowledge with ideas, hunches, and traditions to make wise decisions. Um, it would be, at least at this state of our profession, really impossible to make decisions just based on science. They're a part of the equation. We need science, though, to understand the physical, biological, and social processes that cause those transitions to go from where we are to where we want to be or to keep us in the state that we are. So we do have to understand the physical, biological, and social confines or constructs. Science will help us with those. Um, also, it's important to discover principles on which to make those wise decisions. Some ideas and information are more reliable than others. 
science will help us discover which of those are principles or really well-founded, strong um, ideas of how the world works. There's a whole lot of other reasons that we need science. I just want you to know we're going to focus on science in this class, but it's not the end-all, do-all. It's about integrating science with other kinds of information, another part of that word, integrated range management. What are the impacts of our decision? Well, if we make good decisions, we could end up to an appropriate, sustainable, beautiful future. Some decisions we might make and the world will become a better place. Other decisions that we make could make the situation worse. So I hope in this class we'll learn and share our knowledge and, and traditions and information so that we can come out of this making better decisions to really keep land sustainable and profitable and and there for the future. One of the things that affects our decisions is not just us. I'm sure a few of you in this class own land or came from ranches where you own land and your decisions are largely directed by you and affect largely you. But it, as you see from this graph here, most of the West is not owned by individuals. It's owned by us, the public. And so public lands, including the Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, Bureau of Recreation, uh, Department of uh, Defense uh, owns quite a lot of land. Um, uh, you know, all of those public agencies, state parks, state uh, wildlife uh, organizations, all own public land. They have to understand what the public wants to get from that land, and they are the stewards of those lands. And because we live, most of us live in the West, what the public wants of rangelands is going to influence our management options and our management goals. So just keep that in mind. So what kinds of decisions we make is going to depend on where we live and how much of influence the public uh, has on us. But there's only a few things that we can do to change the world and try to make it a better or brighter future and keep from degrading it. We can make political decisions. Sometimes we get the opportunity to vote on laws, or certainly we vote on our congressional delegations that vote on laws. Uh, we are managing law, uh, we are making management decisions within policies. We can nudge those policies one way or the other. Sometimes we'll end up court in court and through litigation we'll firm up those policies and laws. We'll, uh, that's what litigation often does is tells us what the boundaries of those laws and policies are. So all of those are in the political realm. I know all of that will come out in our discussion. Of course we have the opportunity to buy, sell, products like grass-fed beef um, or products that are branded as ecologically sustainable or we have the opportunity to buy or sell land, buy or sell um, equipment that might have profits that go to management. So all of those would be economic decisions. And then uh, we'll focus mostly on making decisions that have direct impacts on land. Grazing decisions, decisions about fire, decisions about invasive species, decisions about um, human impacts like management and and uh, fences and roads and power lines. So mostly we'll focus on direct decisions, but there's a lot of kinds of decisions we make that affect the future of rangelands. So this is a college class, so we are going to talk a little bit about education and what difference it makes. I guess in this class I really hope that education would convey to society what rangelands are, what is known about these lands. It would stop views that are not objective, Thing, well, for example, a lot of people think that rangelands are in worse conditions than they've ever been. Well, that's not true. In nearly by any measure, rangelands are in the best condition they've been since we've been keeping records. So um, I think those are the kind of non-objective views that only by reading, talking, taking uh, classes like this will you try to put some objectivity into your views. I hope that, that education could lead to wise land use and uh, support for good actions um, by our federal land management agencies, by public lands, by individuals who make decisions. So that's what education can do for us. We certainly push that in this class. We go back to that definition about what range management is. It is the use and stewardship of rangelands to meet the goals and desires of society. Um, what do people want from rangelands? Uh, well, that depends. As I mentioned, when I was started with school, grazing was a good and common purpose for rangelands. Now people have other values for rangelands. Um, who your clients are, 
who is affecting your land management, that's who you need to pay attention to for what people want from rangelands. Could be any. It could be a whole host of the variety of resources that rangelands have to offer: recreation, open space, water, new native plants, forage, wildlife habitat, livestock production. All of those are good uses. And who knows what's the next value of rangelands around the corner? Um, I certainly didn't think that wind power was going to be as big of a resource for rangelands when I was growing up as it is now. So there's always going to be new resources discovered on rangelands, and we rangeland managers are going to find ways to sustainably manage those resources. What are the tools of range management? Well, there's an interesting story about the tools of range management. Um, we know that there are certain natural forces that change lands, and they change the resources that are valuable, variable. So the ecological resources, the ecological surfaces, and resources that are available from land can be altered by fire, herbivory, invasion, as in invasive plants, climate, and, of course, human uses. So those are the forces, those are the things that change rangelands and either make them more like the lands that we want or less. What's interesting about that is that the tools of range management are roughly the same as the native natural uh, forces. So we use fire. We use herbivory in the form of livestock grazing. We understand invasion through weed management. We use human relations and um, sociology to understand and direct human uses. And climate change, we're trying to understand that. We're trying to do things to manage change. Most often we're stuck with doing more local actions such as restoration and rehabilitation in concert and in the context of climate change. So the tools of stewardship are the same as the natural forces that affect land. So what we are really doing in range management is using natural forces, nudging them one way or the other, starting them, stopping them, to create the kind of world that we want, the ecological services and resources that we want from land. In this class, I hope to, you, to help you learn those tools, some of the basic concepts that we'll focus on um, to manage with rangelands is one, that rangelands are a renewable resource, that they can be used, and if properly used, they can be used time and time again in a renewable way. Um, there are some things that are better than others to do for land management. The bottom line is we got to maintain soil and water quality. So there's a lot of things we can do on land. Whether it's right or wrong really depends on whether we're maintaining the soil and water on that land so that lands can recover and continue to improve. We also got to know that rangelands are extensive. I showed some pictures earlier about how widespread they are. We manage lands with extensive and, and ecological principles, not intensive or agronomic principles. I mean, the exception to that might be the weed control or restoration practices where we really build on agronomic principles. Most of the time, we're trying to think of how to manage really large landscapes with really extensive tools based on ecological principles. Another uh, basic principle of range management is that there's really no, it's, I think it's inappropriate to manage land for one use. Rangelands have a whole host of uses. It's our job to try to use those whole host of uses and values. That's what a good range manager does. It's like having a really fancy smartphone and using it just as a calculator. There's a whole lot of things that a smartphone can do, and it would be sort of irresponsible to buy a really fancy phone to just use it as a calculator. It's really irresponsible to manage rangelands and the many values it has for just one use. At least that's my view. You can challenge me on that later in the class. I hope you guys will challenge me on a lot of these things. The next one is that it's really important to think about the multiple ownerships of land and the fact that things that happen on range work across those ownerships. Fire doesn't stop at boundary lines. Water quality is affected by all of your neighbors, including the land that you're responsible for. Weeds don't stop when they come off of one type of land onto another. Open space can only be created if a lot of people with different ownerships are working together. So we'll talk about multiple ownerships and how to manage uh, your values, the desired uses of land with all of the people around you. Um, and then finally, you can't please all the people all the time. Um, you, No matter what you decide to do on your land, you're going to make somebody mad and you're going to make somebody happy. And I hope that by 
helping you understand the, the important principles and the options you have, you can at least rest at night knowing you did the best you could. And you're not going to be able to please all the people all the time. Just um, come to terms with that, and I think we'll all be fine. Um, a couple other principles just to keep in the back of your mind. We're going to talk a lot about succession and disturbance, how those uh, forces are used to manage rangelands. We're all, you also got to realize that rangelands are constantly changing. There's no, we're not going to come to one point and stay there. We're, we're in a continually dynamic system, and we're going to have to deal with change and learn how to manage change. Another one, another principle that you have to remember is, if you do nothing, the land is not going to return to some pre-human paradise, some pre-European spot. We're in a new place. There's new rules. There's a new climate. If you just put a fence around it, keep the animals off, stop the fires, stop invasion, it, everything is not going to be okay. It's going to be different, but it's not all going to go back to some pre-European utopia. So live with it.